Hello everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. My name is Noemi Aliskas. I'm the program manager for the Global Masters of Management Analytics program, um, and I'll also be your host today for the session. I'm joined today by Patrick McClarty, um, who is currently the Director of Strategic Planning and New Initiatives at the Smith School of Business, and he also happens to be an MMA Class of 2017 graduate. And I also have uh, with me Kelly Moore, who is an Application Advisor here at the Smith School of Business. Um, and she is she represents a few of our programs, the Global MMA being one of those programs. Good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Hi. Hey, thank you so much for being here to the both of you. So our session today, just to give you an idea, um, we'll start with a short sort of Q&A with Patrick, uh, followed by a sample lecture on data analytics in revenue management. Um, Patrick will be providing us with a real-world example that involves the analytics of overbooking. I'll then give you a brief overview of the GMMA program. And finally, we'll end with Kelly, who will speak to her role as an application advisor, as well as the, or the admissions requirements for the GMMA program. So our session today should take about 30 minutes, uh, and we will have some time for questions at the end. So if you do have questions, please um, be sure to use that chat box that you have um, on your screen, and we'll collect them all, and then we'll answer them towards the end. All right, so Patrick, <laughs> again, thank you for being with us today. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit about your professional journey, uh, sort of how you became the director of the Strategic Planning and New Initiatives at the Smith School of Business, sort of how that all unfolded? For sure. Uh, so thanks for having me today, Noemi and uh, Kelly. It's great to be here. Um, so uh, my journey is a little bit of a unique one as it relates to uh, MMA alumni, given that uh, I come from uh, a background in education. So I came out of university fully expecting to be a math and science teacher, uh, taught internationally for a little bit. And uh, upon returning to, to Canada, was looking for some opportunities to teach and wasn't finding them. And so ended up recruiting students uh, and to teach internationally. And, and so that was kind of my first foray into the business, uh, business world and the business of education. And then I was responsible for meeting specific sales targets and so forth. And, and so really got interested there. Um, and then an opportunity came to, to join Queen's University and I was actually an application advisor, so I was sitting in Kelly's seat uh, a few years ago. Um, and similarly on that path where I was advising students, but, but really trying to hit key metrics and so forth. And given my background in math and science and that, was really interested. But the real trigger for me which inspired me to go down this MMA data analytics path was um, at the school, we had an initiative to change our CRM from a uh, locally housed a CRM to a cloud-based one, and I was uh, brought in on the implementation team, and so it was my really first introduction to how data is structured and how we might go about using data in order to gain insights and so forth and why we would structure data a certain way, and, and so that really piqued an interest that kind of put me down going down on this path, and so um, from there, I. Uh, managed a team of application advisors, then ran the MMA program for a little bit, and, and then I've since stepped into my current role. And in my current role, really, um, it's a bit of a unique role in that my, I'm, I'm tasked with uh, taking some of the projects that the school is looking to move forward on and, and giving them life and making sure that they get uh, get underway. And so, you know, we're looking at different ways that we deliver education and uh, uh, some of our mental health initiatives and a number of key areas that we're looking to better provide student experience as well as uh, meet students with the programming that, the, that they're looking for that will set them up for success in their careers. And so um, how it relates to my MMA life and, and uh, data and analytics is that we're really doing so from a data-driven uh, perspective and that, um, you know, this isn't decisions because for the sake of decisions that we're actually looking at how students are engaging, what their expectations are of us and where we should be delivering and using that to kind of drive um, where we put our focus to develop this new programming. So yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell where, I'm, where I, how I got here. Okay, awesome, thank you. <clears throat> and so I guess taking you back to your MMA days when you were in the program in, in 2016, 2017, um, can you tell us a little bit about what work sort of looked like for you after the program? So once you had completed those um, evenings or weekend sessions, um, what did it look like for you then coming back um, to work? For sure, yeah. So uh, I was still living in Kingston. When, so I took the traditional MMA program, so the one based in Toronto, uh, where I had a class one weekday and one weekend, uh, uh, or sorry, every weekday and then every alternating weekends. And so uh, I was still living in Kingston at the time, so I was required to commute back and back and forth, and so things were busy there. I had a young family, um, but you know it really was uh, an ebb and flow depending on familiarity with the, the courses. So again, coming from a math and stats background, 
Um, I didn't have as much in terms of the coding and, and so forth, so that was really my talent gap. And, and I, I mentioned this when I was doing recruitment for the MMA program, that everyone coming in will have a certain level of talent gap in that there's, uh, you know, your data, there's stats and your statistical acumen, uh, computing and programming, business acumen, and then communications are really four key areas that the program looks to develop. And computing and, and, and programming was my gap area. So that's really where I had to focus a lot of my efforts. But, uh, you know, I, I had a great team that uh, we all came from diverse backgrounds, uh, both educationally and from an industry representation. And so we leaned on each other to kind of fill those gaps for ourselves. But uh, in terms of what my days looked like, uh, you know, I was in class on Wednesdays. We would typically meet uh, for, my team would meet for an administrative meeting for an hour after class. And then we'd meet two or three times uh, during the week, whether to check in or to actually do a full working session. Um, because I was living in Kingston and even uh, my colleagues, my teammates who were in the GTA, um, they would still be, because GTA is rather large geographically, um, they would be an hour to an hour and a half apart. So we met virtually um, almost exclusively unless we were meeting after class. And so, um, yeah, it was a lot of engagement that way. You know, there's a lot of support from the program in terms of coaching and so forth. But uh, um, it was a lot to take on. You know, the expectation, I think, is 20 to 25 hours a week. Um, uh, there is ebbs and flows to that depending on your familiarity, but uh, probably averages out to be that as you go in. So you have to go in full, both uh, both eyes open. And uh, the family decision, you know, you need that support from uh, – from your significant others or whoever your support group is because you'll be leaning on them for the year. Great. Awesome. And how do you feel that the MMA degree impacted your career the most? Yeah. So um, the reason why I chose the MMA versus maybe an MBA or some of some more traditional programs is really that focus on the technical skills, and, and that's what I really wanted to focus to gain some insight on. But it was that pairing with managerial um, skills as well. I, I really saw myself that I wasn't going to be a true technician long term. That I didn't see that I was going to be um, the one. Uh, executing on the computations. I was going to be more on the management side. And so it really hit a, hit a, a, a niche there that I was that I was hoping to, to get act out of. And I think that it has benefited me that way. So, um, you know, I've been given a number of these opportunities because of the, my uh, background and in, in acumen and data, but, but also how it's developed my skills from a managerial perspective and, and effective communication of those ideas and, and, um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, the management leadership aspect as well that gets honed within the program, both from your learnings and readings as well as your involvement within teams and the extracurriculars that, that uh, Smith supports the students through. Great. And um, as far as the MMA degree is concerned and what you teach in the curriculum, um, what are some of the skills that you've sort of taken from that that you think would help students set themselves apart um, from others? Uh, yeah. That work? This may sound uh, so. I think that the real skill set that is the differentiator the, in terms of Smith and and where the MMA has grown and, and focused its efforts is really on that development of those so soft skills and communication skills and and managerial skills as it relates to to tech. Um, so you know, often finds, and if you when when you talk to leaders in, in the space, that it's rarely a technical solution that is a barrier to implementation. It's more often than not uh, managerial or self-imposed in that it's hard to get leadership to buy in or and you know your your user team to buy in or so forth and that those are really managerial influences rather than technical solutions and so I think that that's a key differentiator of the the GMMA and, and the MMA suite here uh, at, at Smith is that it is that focus on um, app application and implementation and communication manage management of specific technical projects and analytics projects, not just that you're learning the hard technical skills. So you'll learn a mix of the both, and it's in those softer skill sets which will differentiate you in terms of leadership potential and, and as you progress through your career. Great. Awesome. Thank you. So I think that makes a lot of sense to sort of now talk about um, what, what all of these skills sort of look like in the real world. Um, so maybe you can take us through a little bit about the analytics of overbooking and what that looks like. For sure. Um, so uh, I was asked today, so one of the opportunities that came about after I graduated from the program is, is uh, for the last two years I've had the opportunity to teach on our MBA program in a, in a class called Analytical Decision Making. It's also one of the classes that you take in the GMMA program. And so uh, I wanted to give a bit of a taster uh, of what a, what a lecture may look like 
and um, what it is, you know, how it can be applied and so forth, and some of the discussion that, that happens beyond it. And so, you know, given the scenario, it's something that we've all lived. Uh, you go to the airport and, and you're, um, uh, you know, somehow they say it's overbooked and they're, they, you're going to be bumped and so forth, and it's frustrating, incredibly frustrating. And, uh, um, and so, you know, I wanted to, to walk you through kind of how those decisions come about and why businesses make those decisions and, and also end off on a discussion about, you know, how management plays a role in, into this. And so, you know, if we take the scenario that, uh, you know, maybe you're a new business analyst that just started at a, a small to large uh, airline carrier, we'll call it Smith Airlines for now, and as a proof of concept, you're working on this idea of, for a single flight that has 30 first class seats and 195 economy class seats, um, so this is a scenario that you're living in that you're trying to see what kind of reservation policy that you should establish that uh, can meet some, some key performance indicators that, you know, maybe are set out by leadership. And so um, if we take, you know, we'll break this down uh, into two key areas that, that we're looking to, to fill the plane in, and that we have these first-class passengers, you know, tickets cost 4300 Based on historical data, you've done some, some descriptive analytics and you see that uh, the demand follows roughly a Poisson distribution of a mean of 35. Um, and historically, passengers show up about 93% of the time. You know, from a policy perspective, first class passengers, if they are no show, then they are at, for a full refund. And if they are do happen to be bumped, if you've oversold and you have to bump a first class passenger, they're entitled to a full refund plus a $900 inconvenience penalty. And then with regards to your economy passengers, similarly, Poisson distribution of 205, you know, they have a higher percentage of checking in because there is no um, reimbursement. If they no-show, that's it. Uh, they can be bumped to first class if capacity on the plane shows, and then, but if they're bumped, then they're going to be offered incentives to potentially delay into another flight. And so these are the two key areas that, that uh, um, you know, that you're going to use as your, your target audiences and how you build out your model. And so. Um, there's a few different ways that you can go about doing this, but the one way that I wanted to show, oh, so our, our key question is going to be, how many tickets do we actually sell? So what will our reservation policy? So in terms of the managerial situation that we're trying to solve today, it's what, how do I tell my frontline staff or set as a policy in this flight that we have 30 physical seats in first class and 195 physical seats in, in uh, economy, how many tickets do I actually sell? And so one way to, to handle this is through simulation modeling. And so simulation modeling is a powerful tool that allows you to test managerial assumptions. The way it differs from some of the other models that you learn in the program is rather than uh, using some math to come out with a specific answer, you actually get to, to establish what, what situations you want to test and put them back into the model to test them out. And so it's a little bit uh, uh, flipped that way versus something like regression analysis. And, you know, it's based on the law of large numbers that in repeated tests that the outcomes will start to align on uh, what the true probability or what the true outcomes will be. And the key indicator here that, that makes simulation modeling uh, really effective in this case is that it allows you to make decisions on a distribution rather than a point estimate. And so rather than say, well, on average, we get 35 people who want to buy a ticket, it actually allows you to go simulate on a specific basis and make decisions on a on a distribution rather than a specific point estimate because if you've done any of the reading on the flaw of averages and so forth that it can can become uh, pretty detrimental if you only use one specific metric and so having the ability to make decisions on a distribution is, is very powerful and so you know if we're considering this as managers and what, what do we want to test out well maybe we want to go with a policy that uh, you oversell from zero seats maybe we have no overbooking through 10 seats in first class and, and zero to 25 seats in economy. And then all possible combinations therein. And so if you look at those combinations, you're gonna have 286 scenarios. And if we set it up that maybe we do 5,000 iterations of each scenario, that for our simulation, we're gonna get 13 and a half years of data in about under two minutes that it would take to run. So again, the power for this simulation is, uh, is because each one of those iterations would be as if it was a daily flight. So rather than wait for 5,000 flights to happen and see if that was the right policy, you get to test this through simulations. And so um, this is where we would take all of those assumptions that we established in terms of the price point and whether you can, whether you can bump people and, and what the penalty, the, the penalty is to bump people and so forth, and you'd build that into your model um, through some 
Principally within the program, you'd be using R or Python. Uh, there are, for some toy data sets, you can do it on, uh, uh, there's tools that sit on top of Excel and so forth. And I won't walk you through the coding here. I guess that's a little bit uh, behind the curtain for now. But uh, you put that into your system and, and run it through and, and look at your iterations, and you get something that looks like this. And so this would be some of the output. And so you see here that I was tracking uh, the total profit for each one of these scenarios. So you know, one through eight, those would be different simulations of those 286 scenarios that I saw and, and give you an idea of where that distribution of profit would lie. And similarly, I was watching the pa number of passengers not seated in uh, a particular uh, in economy. And so over those eight simulations, what our average was and kind of where our distributions would be. And so I, I, when taking this information, then you would go about and you would see, and this is where simulation modeling allows you to, to consider different variables across. And so when we walked out, when we came into this situation, we said, well, profitability is going to be our decision factor. And so if we were to use decision factor, then our policy that we would establish would be that we would overbook by four first-class tickets and 20 economy tickets. And so, uh, if you look, back, if you consider back to what we had, we had 30, 30 physical seats in first class and 195 physical seats in uh, in economy. And so, therefore, we'd be selling 34 and uh, 215 in uh, in uh, respectively. And the reason why we would do this is because this po po policy will actually increase our profitability by 3.52%. So when you, even when you factor in the fact that uh, there's a penalty for having to bump somebody and potentially a re full refund on first class and so forth, when you factor in that you're making that decision on a distribution and each iteration, and you, um, that this, will, this policy will actually increase your profitability to that. Now, you may say to yourself, well, 3.52 doesn't seem all that significant on one flight, but if you consider that as on the entire margin of profitability across your whole organization, uh, it would have a huge impact, especially when uh, industry like airlines run on uh, about a four or two to two to six percent margin. So that that is a pretty significant impact to your bottom line on why they would go about uh, being incentivized to run this. Now, I mentioned earlier that we're making this decision in terms of policy based on profitability, but we also have what other implications would this policy change have? And so by running those simulations, you can track a number of things as you go through. And so I, I tracked the number of first class passengers that would be bumped in each, each one of these situations. And so for the current policy as outlined, uh, about 50% of the time that there would be no bumped first class passengers, and about 50% of the time there would be no bumped economy passengers. And with this policy, your plane is flying full 58% of the time versus less than 5% of the time with no overbooking because people don't show up all the time and so forth. And so from a management perspective, maybe that's something that I'm comfortable with. And this is where it gets into um, the decisions of we said profitability was our biggest decision maker in this, but maybe it's not. You know, maybe you've been watching social media and seen someone dragged off of a plane and said, I don't want that to be our company. And so 50% is too low of a threshold. Then you can establish what those thresholds will be for your organization and make policy adjustments based on that. So maybe you want to have 75% uh, of the time there's no bumped economy passengers. Then you can run that simulation and see which of those policies meets that criteria. And so it allows you to have more managerial influence uh, as you go about that. And so, again, this would be just one possibility of modeling, simulation modeling is only one model that you'll learn with it to, to apply to the problem and, and it'll, that paired with things like regression and optimization and clustering methods will give you a powerful toolkit to address dynamic problems because I'm sure you're out there thinking to yourself, well, how realistic is this situation? I only have first class versus uh, economy, I only have one price point and so forth and so how do, we, the thing about modeling is it's never complete. You're always going to find ways to improve upon it and push it further and make it more realistic and so forth. And that's where it may include uh, some of the other tool set, toolkits that you'll learn within the program. So things like to make it more realistic, we have dynamic pricing. So rather, you know, if there are 225 seats on a plane, there's likelihood that there was 225 different prices to get on that plane, as, as, as anyone who's shopped for uh, airfare before knows. Similarly, you know, I'm, if you've gone online to, to purchase tickets, you've seen that rather than first class and economy, they often there's about anywhere from four to seven different uh, purchase plans. You, there's 
straight economy, economy plus, economy super plus, first class light, and so forth. And so maybe what are the increased buckets and different pricing and refund criteria? How does that have an impact on profitability? Seasonal demand cycles. Obviously, your demand is going to be different depending on the time of year and maybe location and so forth. How do our loyalty programs include on this? So having an, a, an initial established model will help to allow you to iterate on it and improve upon it. <clears throat> and then lastly, one of the things I mentioned that out of this program that the focus would be on the managerial implications and, and discussion on that form would be what is what becomes your ultimate decision criteria? And so is it always profitability? Is it customer satisfaction? What thresholds are you willing to work with? You know, uh, maybe it's a reduction in cost. And so you, you know, you implement a policy where if you don't have a certain level of of uh, passenger engagement that you cancel the flight and you're okay with that. So there's different ways that you can test it. And so that's where the managerial element comes in. To do the simulation modeling isn't the most challenging part. The most challenging part is how do you ultimately make use that to make decisions and then implement and be effective on those decisions. So that's how um, you know all of these models would iterate upon and so forth. And then lastly, as it extends, I'm sure the majority of the audience here today, and myself included, that we may or will likely never ever work for an airline, and so how applicable is this to my life? It's an interesting example and a nice thought experiment as to you know how airlines set their policy. But within that GMMA classroom that you're going to have, there's a diversity of industry representations, and they'll provide insight in how those models while they may seem like they have little to do with your current roles, could be applied well beyond the example provided. And so, you know, this airline overbooking is really a problem that applies to any, any business problem that has a limited number of time-sensitive resources and a strong demand. So ticketing at a sporting or a band event or a music event or hotel rooms or even uh, an academic program with a hard start date. There's overbooking models that we can do that make sure that we reach certain capacity and and uh, have those uh, the seats full or when uh, when the starting time comes so uh, that was a little brief intro to what uh, what you may be expected uh, to take on in uh, in the class again this would be uh, one model that we would cover in analytical decision making and it would be furthered upon and further case studies and discussion amongst the group so with that, uh, I'll uh, pass it back to Noemi, who's going to talk a little bit more about, you know, how you uh, fit in and how you joined the program here. Coming up shortly. Great. Thank you so much, Patrick. Um, that was really interesting, and it's really interesting to see how we can use analytics in the real world. Um, so now that we've talked about how we use analytics outside of the classroom, let's talk a little bit about what it's like to be actually inside the classroom or in the GMMA program as a student. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I'll sort of take you through this slide um, relatively quickly. Um, on the right-hand side, you'll see we've got uh, the curriculum outlined there, so you can see uh, which classes are given online and which are, are given in person. So the GMMA program is great because it offers this sort of really unique blend between um, online learning um, with a, a sort of team-based learning um, on this sort of really engaging collaborative web platform that we call Smith Learning, um, and then in-person, uh, again, team-based learning as well. Um, and that sort of in-person um, learning happens through these global immersive uh, sessions that we call residential sessions. Uh, so the program starts just to sort of take you through uh, what the, 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 the schedule for the program looks like. The program starts you out in one of those immersive um, in-person sessions in Toronto in January of 2020. Uh, and then those sessions continue on throughout the program. So our next one is in May in Kingston. In August, we're in Mannheim, Germany, um, and then we finish off the program in January 2021 in San Francisco um, in the USA. Uh, and then in between these sessions, uh, students are taking, like I said, these, these online courses through our Smith Learning Platform, which is really interactive. Um, it allows for a lot of engagement um, from student to student, team to team, and, and then student to professor and professor to student as well. Um, there's also a capstone project, which is involved in the GMMA, the GMMA program, which is great. Uh, the, pro the capstone project allows students to start applying what they're learning in the classroom to um, a real-world project, and that can take any form from, um, you know, starting a new venture to um, solving a, a sort of existing business problem, whether it be in their organization or in a new organization. Um, it can take on a lot of different forms, but it allows students to really sort of dig down deep, start applying what they've 
learned in the classroom to um, real world business problems. And then, so that's sort of a, a, a quick overview of the, the program structure, the program schedule, and the curriculum. Once you graduate from the GMMA program, you join a, a sort of vast network of classmates and alumni. So you're not only an alumni of an MMA degree program, um, we've got about 600, almost 700 MMA alumni across the world. Uh, we now have about 60 MMAI, MMAI alumni, which is um, a program that we launched in 2019. They just graduated recently. Um, and the Smith School of Business itself has about 25,000 um, alumni, not to mention the Queen's University uh, umbrella, of which you are also an alumni. Um, so you, once you graduate the GMMA program, you then join this sort of global, really connected alumni network, um, which is great because having participated in these immersive sessions, um, you're also building your network around the world. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to grow that network, make some new connections, start some businesses, um, and, and just sort of grow, grow analytics and grow your career as well. So this is sort of the, the GMMA program in a nutshell. So I'd like to um, take it over to Kelly, who will talk to us a little bit about her role as an application advisor, um, as well as the academic, or the admissions story requirements for the GMMA program. Hi, everybody. So my role as an application advisor is to guide you through the application process and present your best profile to the admissions committee. So typically what we like to see in um, our applicants is uh, an undergraduate degree from a recognized university, and we're also within that degree looking for at least one math or stats course that covers linear regression or hypothesis testing with a fairly robust, robust grade in that, a B plus or higher. Uh, we are also looking for a minimum of two years of relevant work experience. Now we will consider internships as well, so if you're just shy of that two year experience, Please don't fret. Uh, I welcome you to, you know, reach out to us, talk to us about your experiences, uh, because they will look at other options available to you. Uh, we also like to see a GMAT score in some cases. Typically, we're looking for a score of 650 or higher, but this may be waived as well, uh, based on a holistic approach of your application. Uh, with respect to the application, we'll also ask for two letters of reference, your resume, a cover letter, and we'll finalize it with an interview uh, before going to the admissions committee. Uh, typically, we like to see that process completed within 30 days, so we do like to be very, fairly streamlined in that process, and I do like to carry it through as quickly as possible so that uh, you can typically get an answer from the admissions committee within one to two weeks after your interview. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, so that sort of brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, we do have some time, some time for questions, so if you want to send those into that chat box that you have on your screen, uh, we'll, like I said, we'll collect them and then we'll answer them. Thanks. Okay, so I've got one question here um, asking about um, if there are scholarships available for GMMA and if so, what, what is the median value? So yes, there are in fact um, some merit-based scholarships that are available for the GMMA program. Um, the, the, the scholarships themselves range in amount from, I would say, about $2,000 to $10,000. Um, and they are, as I said, merit-based, so they are based on the um, review that the scholarship committee does of all of the applications that come through. So um, once a candidate is accepted into the program, automatically their file is reviewed for a scholarship by the scholarship committee. Um, and, and so they, you know right, right when you get your offer uh, to the program whether or not you've been granted a scholarship and the amount as well. All right. So someone is asking, what's the percentage between methodology learning and real business case scenarios? Uh, so that, that's a great question. That actually, I would say, depends largely on um, the professor who's teaching the course. So all of our professors use, use excuse me, um, a wide array of teaching methodologies and tools uh, throughout their, their courses. So obviously case base is, is a big one. <laughs> Most of our, our courses or our classes and our professors use that. Um, there, you know, and they'll use other methodologies as well. There's more sort of formalized um, examinations. There's guest speakers, lecturers, company visits, um, quizzes, all types of different um, methodologies and teaching tools. And, and I just wanted to add, as a faculty member, so the director of these programs and actually one of the instructors, uh, Steve Thomas for Big Data uh, Analytics, um, he's done some work in order to put together some live data sets of, of real of organizations, and so he's worked with uh, a bank here in Canada and a property management company and a few others, so that students, when they're going through these projects, there there are cases that they cover, but there's also uh, live real data sets that uh, that they'll be getting their hands dirty on and, and working with as well. So so if the the uh, breakdown is on 
methodology and, and real business case scenarios. While it may not be, you know, the true business cases, but there's also live data sets that are, that are being used in the class as well, which is in, in massively beneficial. Great. We have another question here asking um, the, the average experience of the 2019 class, which I'm assuming is a work experience. Uh, so the GMMA program actually is a, a brand new program to the School of Business. So um, there was no class in 2019. Uh, our first class will be launching in January 2020, um, and so far, average age experience or average work experience, I would say, is looking um, anywhere between uh, sort of two to all the way up to 15 or 20. Um, it's, it's a really diverse group. We have a lot of people coming in with um, really diverse backgrounds, both sort of work experience levels, industries, um, uh, and, and just sort of uh, positions in their industry as well. Um, I, so unfortunately, I can't speak to the uh, work experience um, average for the GMMA program, but uh, if, we, if I just take you back to this slide, this is a bit of a snapshot of the MMA uh, program breakdown. So as far as work experience was concerned for 2019, we had about eight years for the MMA program. Um, given that the GMMA is, is sort of very similar to the MMA program, I would say um, you can expect probably about, um, about the same, around eight um, as the average with like I said, anywhere from two to 15 to 20 years of experience. And someone was asking how the tests or exams would be administered in the program, which is a really great question. Uh, again, sort of depends on the professor themselves. For the in-person classes, sort of your typical um, in-person exam, uh, although some of our professors like to sort of stay away from the more traditional examination style, so you'll be doing a lot of things like assignments um, and, and case-based work. Uh, when it, with respect to the online courses, um, again, I'm trying to stay away from the sort of more formalized examinations. If there are, then they will be online. Um, but again, you can expect a lot of assignments um, in, in the program as well. And someone's asking how much computer coding is involved in the GMMA program. Um, so the expectation coming in is not necessarily that you know coding or have um, sort of this extensive coding experience. These, the, the coding itself will be taught to you in the courses that require you to know or have some sort of knowledge of, of coding. Um, we do have some pre-module work that we give all of our students before the program starts so that they can at least get some a bit of a baseline uh, with respect to the coding languages that we use in the program, which typically are Python um, and R, which are sort of the big two. Um, and then you know, each course, again, will vary depending on what the professor needs or what the course requires um, of the students to complete, but you can expect whatever it is uh, coding-wise that needs to be learned to be successful in a class, the professor will take the time to teach you what it is that you need to know. Um, so there's no expectation that you're coming in being a pro at coding. So the next question we have is, does the program provide an Ah, yes, that's a good question. So um, there are no sort of formal internships uh, as part of the GMMA program. So the, the, the big sort of work experience, I guess, component would be that capstone project. And that's really where students get to um, work with a company, again, like I was saying, whether it's their existing company or a new one, uh, and really get to showcase their skills and, and the knowledge that they're gaining in the program. Um, so that's, that is the expectation is that's what students will use um, as sort of a form of internship, I guess. Um, you know, students are welcome to source their own internships if they feel like there's value to that and they would like to do that as they're completing the program. Uh, the great thing about the GMMA um, and most of our programs here at Smith is that they are um, designed in a way that allows people to continue to work as they complete the program. Um, so there is, you know, if a student were to want to outsource an internship, they are more than welcome to do that. Um, we don't provide that for them, but the opportunity is there, absolutely. All right. So I think that's all of the questions that we have. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for being here, and thank you to Kelly as well. Um, this was a great session. Thank you all, um, and we hope you have a great week ahead.